there we are. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I think it's my third year in the conference and uh, I, I really, really enjoy every year. I want to congratulate Dr. Gassan and his team uh, for organizing another amazing conference. And uh, I have to say that um, the skills of Dr. Popov, I mean, I, have, I haven't seen before in surgeries and videos, but he's, uh, he's absolutely top notch. And uh, Dr., the rest, of, the rest of us, more or less, we know each other, but Dr. Pistofidis, he can't hear me now, so I say, I can say all good things about him. In Greece, not only in the UK, but in Greece, he's considered a guru. All trainees of laparoscopy gynae want to train under him. So he, it was, he was a great addition to this year's conference and thank you, Dr. Gassan and team. As for us, uh, we are a small clinic and, um, and we are trying to do our best for the couples. We see many couples here that see us as a last resort because of our success rates. And, uh, and you will see what I'm talking about later towards the end of the, of the slide. We try to make as personalized fertility care as possible, and we like the couples to enjoy healthy pregnancies and, and healthy babies. Uh, for this conference, I started preparing Dr. Gassan from one exactly one year ago. Look at the buds. I flew to Milan. Back then it was possible. It was right before the pandemic as it was starting in China. And Milan was the next to be hit, but I was there right before. So this conference was there right before uh, the pandemic hit the city. So it was an amazing conference, only focused on Fiestre, on endometriosis and infertility. So a lot of the knowledge I'm conveying it to you today is, was uh, from that uh, conference. So uh, just one slide. How does endometriosis cause infertility? Mechanically, it distorts the anatomy. It impacts the way the tubes and the ovaries talk to each other. The ovulation is not the same and the ovarian tissue is reduced. Inflammation in the pelvis, we know. Egg quality is impaired, we know. Antral follicle counts and AMH are reduced. And those of us who deal a lot with implantation, we know that the endometrium is not the same. There's increased response to estradiol and decrease, decrease to P4, to progesterone. And this leads to luteal phase insufficiency. Empirically, we know that we must give a lot of progesterone to these women to hold the pregnancy. And of course, couples come and tell us, doctor, it's painful. We can't try as we used to. So first, first, first uh, slide for our gynecologists who are following us. In women with endometriomas. Can you do IUI? Yes, you can. If the tubes are open, you can. Should we use Clomid? No, use clonal gonadotrophins. Don't do natural cycles. Don't do with Clomid or Femara. Go straight to gonadotrophins. It works better. Okay, just one brief note because it's a common question I, I get. Uh, now, let me get this part. If I can not it. All right, uh, how does, like going back to the debate, yeah, uh, the presence of endometrioma makes the ovaries worse. So how, how come all the guidelines that I'm going to present you further down the line say, don't remove the endometrioma? My, my topic today is easy. I have to just follow the guidelines, but you will see by the end of my topic, it's not the right thing to do. We have to break the guidelines. So an endometrioma stops ovulation. Endometrioma ovaries, ovaries with endometrioma, their AMH over time declines faster than the ovaries without, yeah? And the antral follicle count in those ovaries with endometrioma is reducing faster than healthy ovaries. And why? Because one of the speakers of the conference was there and Dr. Somiliana, Dr. Candiani, because the endometriomas contain reactive oxygen species, inflammatory factors, proteolytic enzymes. All of these affect the quality of the, of the follicles 
around the uh, actual endometrioma. So that ovary is not working very, very well. But then why don't we remove? Going to the guidelines, the Americans are saying, hmm, very difficult question, doctors. Uh, let, let us leave it to the doctor and the risks and benefits to be balanced by the clinician. But don't just say endometriosis and endometriomas straight to IVF. Something is wrong there. Don't remove, but don't go to IVF for the infertile couple. The ESRA guidelines, which are very old now, they're very old. We should be working on, uh, on actually making them, making them like updated. First one, and it's actually a recommendation grade A. In infertile women with endometrioma three, don't do cystectomy. It doesn't improve success rates. More than three, maybe do cystectomy to improve pain, but not for fertility. Not really clear because all of us know it does affect fertility, the presence of endometrioma. Again, the Italian groups, what is bigger? How much should be an endometrioma for us to consider to remove it? Maybe up to three, maybe up to, up to four centimeters before we remove. The Italians say four. The friends also say 2018, all things considered, do not remove just for fertility. Let it be. Very strange. And the Italian uh, guidelines also go with the, with the evidence, with a strong suggestion. It's unlikely to improve the removal of endometriomas, the fertility of uh, fertility chance of couples. Yeah. The Royal College plays it a bit more politically as the British usually do. And they, they say, well, okay, let's personalize. So go straight to IVF when you think that we're running out of time. And this actually matches the categories that Dr. Popov just, uh, just uh, mentioned. So when we have low AMH, when endometriomas are on both sides, then when it's the, not the first surgery, but the second or the third, then straight to IVF. When on the other side, there is good ovarian reserve and only on one side, then of course, if there's any suspicion of something wrong, then go for surgery. This makes more sense and goes together with our clinical impressions. The big studies that all these guidelines, uh, the landmark studies that all these guidelines are referring to. The big study from Dr. Hamdan in 2015 and T.C. Lee says that endometrioma does not affect the IVF outcome. So why remove it before IVF? And other studies going from 2012 from Dr. Lee, again Hamdan, Dr. Kaponis, Dr. Amiri, again from 2018, a big meta-analysis of 11 studies, the last one down my slide, but there's no significant difference in pregnancy rate per cycle, clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate in, amongst women who went under, underwent surgery versus fertility treatment. And then let's go to the complications of surgery. How can actually surgery make it worse for couples? Another study from the UK from 2010. I bet if I actually ask all the gynees, I didn't know, all the gynees in the group, how, uh, what is the risk of reoperation over 10 years for a woman with endometriosis, they will say less than 51%. It's actually 51%. And we must carefully counsel our couples, the infertile ones, yeah? But one in two, you will have to have another operation, okay? So what will happen to these ovaries? We have to be careful before we go, we go in for the first operation. And as, as Dr. Popov said, let's be very careful who does the operation, okay? Everybody can remove a cyst from the ovary, but what will happen to that ovary afterwards if the couple want to have a baby? Then the counseling has to go to the, to the risk of actually making the woman menopausal or premenopausal after surgery. What are the risks? 2.4%, 1.7% according to a couple of studies, again, uh, from Italy. This must also go into the counseling because it makes our job as fertility doctors very, very difficult. 
a woman goes, has her uh, laparoscopy, endometrioma gone, they come to us, zero antral follicles. But she comes with the impression that everything was fine in the operation. So she needs to know. Um, again, going to the studies that mention the reduction of AMH and the AFC, you can see both in this study and the next one that I'm presenting, that the AFC and the AMH drop down here on the right can be up to 57%. This is, these are big numbers. And the same goes on the andral follicular count. Okay, these, these two papers can be read in two ways that it doesn't make a difference and it does, but we need to be aware that not in, ex, in not experienced hands, the ovarian reserve can be harmed with uh, removal of endometrioma. So in summary, what are the negatives of removing an endometrioma before IVF? It, it tell, we know that it will be, we will have less follicles, so lower success rates, less oocyte retrieved, lower estrogen, so low, low, lower production of estrogen. We will need higher numbers of injections, higher units of injections. And all of that, with minimal, if any, effect on the chances of the pregnancy. Going to the to the to bypassing the problem. This is a classic question I get from gynecologists. Doctor, why don't I give you three months of GnRH? Maybe the endometrioma will shrink, and then actually will do the IVF. It doesn't work that well. Plus, it takes away out of our hands the clinicians. The, the latest, biggest weapon that we have, which is the agonist trigger. So now, as you all know, we are moving towards a zero OHSS clinic because we have this luxury of an antagonist protocol with a GnRH agonist trigger. If the woman is downregulated already for three months, then we have to go for the classic beta hcg trigger. And if she has a lot of follicles, she will end up in pain or like in intensive care, if we do a fresh transfer and it's secondary OHSS. So we don't recommend trying to shrink the ovaries with endometriosis before, before, before stimulation. And as of course, Dr. Dr. Yorgo said, or Professor Pistofidis said, uh, it's, uh, we must not forget adenomyosis, yeah? Because without good, machines, ultrasound machines, and without uh, our mind fixed to it, it's difficult to diagnose. We can miss it. We can miss it. And um, I, in my clinic, I have two top-notch machines and one older one. I cannot see endometriosis with the older one. It's obvious with a new machine. So this is awareness, yeah? It does reduce success rates. It does uh, increase miscarriage rate, and it's better if we have frozen embryos to suppress and shrink uh, the adenomyotic area in the uterus uh, before we do a frozen embryo transfer. These are, these are clear now. And this is something that has given us, this approach with the down regulation has given us a lot of good pregnancies in, in uteri that were very big and adenomyotic and they were unoperable. So what has changed? This is us pre-COVID. <laughs> And this is us post-COVID, the same team, full of masks without social distancing. This is a secret Santa picture. But I put this, I put this there to, to show you what can, change, what can change before and after stimulation, yeah? So this is a lovely lady that everybody can see there, the endometrioma is around two centimeters and it's after operation. So it's a recurrence, yeah? But now you can't see it. This is the same ovary after stimulation. We have to keep in mind that there is, this ovary has been operated upon. There is an endometrioma there hiding and we have to mark it in our heads and try to avoid it with a needle because ideally we shouldn't puncture. We shouldn't puncture for the risk of infection and pelvic, uh, pelvic abscesses and adhesions. But because endometrioma is there, and that's why I put the pictures, it doesn't mean we can't do stimulation. We can do a very good stimulation. The same here, a lady with hydrosalpins and adhesions post-operation. You can see only a few antral folks in that ovary and see how that ovary is hiding, stuck behind 
the middle part of the uterus. Yeah, we had to press, press, press abdominally during the egg collection to get it to move closer to the cervix. We puncture the cervix with a needle, but thank God the cervici are allowing us to do so, and uh, and uh, we don't get bleeding. So she had nice two 5AA blastoses, both genetically normal. She's 41, both genetically normal. And look, this is the same ovary. You see how nicely, like the cervix is here on the right, how nicely it allow us to stimulate it allowed us to stimulate here. That's a third case endometrioma, no operation, and then gone. So we were able to retrieve actually 19 eggs from this lady, and she's also at 39. So the, we can retain the, the take home message from these pictures is that from the IVF perspective, retaining the anatomy without operating on all endometriomas at first stage is not a bad idea. We will get more eggs, the quality will be compromised, endometriosis is still there, but I'd rather have more to pick from than maybe fewer and with the ovary being stuck at the fundus of the uterus after an operation. And another big, big, big weapon in the last few years in our hands, the frozen cycles, the vitrification. Dr. Popov mentioned it. We can defrost, thaw embryos very successfully. And uh, thank God in our clinic over the past four or five years, only three embryos have died. The other like close to the thousands, they have, we have managed to, to get them to survive. So, and these actually studies are coming out now, look at the low, lower lines that even with endometriosis present, the frozen embryo replacement rate is actually better uh, with freeze-all compared to fresh. And Professor Schoolcraft with Dr. Sari a couple of years ago, actually three years ago now, have managed to kind of identify the reason be dealing with integrity. And they're proving that, as I say here in red, if we do freeze-all and we do prolong GnRH only before the frozen cycle, then we actually come, with, uh, come out with excellent outcomes for fertility. Now, one thing I just saw, and I want to put in your attention, it came up in the ESRE like uh, library, is that they managed to do in India a randomized trial with aspirating endometriomas after two months of GnRH. And they are producing better results with, um, for pregnancy rates with aspiration. Aspiration, of course, as you all know, we have abandoned because of the risk of forming, uh, of forming uh, um, abscesses and infection. But it's kind of an old, uh, old um, uh, let's say, notion that it's coming back. Uh, the latest on the uh, frozen cycles. This came out just, just, just this month that from the US, big clinics like Richard Scott and Professor Desigler, they're saying that recurrent implantation failure does not exist. Give me three embryos and I'll give you a live birth 95% of the times. But of course, not all women have three <laughs> euploid embryos. And we know that this study does not really focus on endometriosis, but it's a sign. It's a sign that we should be moving towards the frozen cycles. Our secret weapon here in ORCID, we do the BCL6, we do the receptiva, <clears throat> because the real question is, doctor, that woman doesn't have endometrioma, or she has endometrioma and it got removed. Is the lining still affected? Can I put this euploid embryo in this endometrium? Nobody could answer. Before these people in, uh, in Oregon put out this BCL6 test. So we take a biopsy of the lining, we send it to them and they tell us if somewhere endometriosis is affecting the endometrium. In that case, we do two more months of down regulation. If the integrin is high, if she's a head, she will have a luteal phase defect and we work accordingly. We only had 11 patients that did it so far because it is expensive to courier there, but it is the future. This is the burning question because we say three euploid embryos. Most of our women have one. 
It's one shot to the baby, one shot. So I will not tell you what to do. I will use the Socrates method. If we call it in Greek, the obstetric method. So he used to go to the, to the market in Athens, to the Agora, and don't tell his patients, his, uh, his uh, uh, students, anything. He would just like a midwife, take, make the, the correct answer come out from them, like clear water from the spring in the mountains, yeah? So the questions are here in front of us. Is endometriogamma affecting air quality? Yes. Can laparoscopy, especially in their own hands, make negative future IVF? Yes. Is laparoscopy improving IVF success rates? Most likely not before IVF. Is endometriosis reducing implantation rates? Yes. Is a freeze-all strategy in general, we're waiting for endometriosis, more successful nowadays? Yes. If a woman with, that does IVF, does genetic testing, will she have less risk of miscarriage? Yes. And then the last line, can we improve the baby rates by once we have the frozen embryos? The PGS part remains to be seen. Studies are not there yet. If we have endometriosis and endomyosis and we do generates, yes, we can. So to all the gynies out there, if you had a couple infertile with endometrioma, what would you do first? IVF with free zone plus minus PGS or operation first? I'll let you choose. The answer is not easy. And that's why this debate is, uh, is there. And I don't know if it was actually Dalai Lama's quote, but that's how I found it online. Now we know the guidelines. Now we know the rules. Now we have to break them. And Professor Popov, and this is my last slide, exactly came to the same conclusion. So big minds think alike to do the same protocol to his couples in conjunction with the, with the fertility with the fertility doctor. It's just that when couples are infertile, I believe that sizes of endometriomas do not matter that much. If she has symptoms, yes, operate. But if not, then let's collect the eggs and make genetically, put genetically normal embryos in the freezer. So this is what we follow. Ovarian stimulation, maybe multiple times. Freeze the embryos, consider PGS according to the age. And then that's where I have an objection about the limits that Dr. Popov said, 38, 39, because we do a lot of genetic testing here. Embryos come up abnormal over the age of 35. So we must be aware. Okay, then if normal embryos are found, then clear all the endometriosis, clear. Laparoscopy, generates, and then if we want to do receptiva and of course other endometrial assessments, let's do to make sure that we're putting the embryo in the absolutely, absolutely, absolutely best prepared endometrium. And we'll do a single embryo transfer to ensure the woman will not have the complications of a, of a, multiple, uh, of a multiple pregnancy. And these are our success rates for 2020, just came out. These are clinical pregnancy rates. You see the, the red is the frozen. You see how high they are, only because most of these embryos, and we're lucky to live in Dubai, that uh, genetic testing is not considered to be an expensive add-on. You see how high we are. So of course the aim is for the 100%. Yeah, and this is the oldest of us, remember Boris Becker, and really impressed me when in an interview I was very young, he said, I, do, I remember only the games I lost. Now I understand. I only remember the couples that had normal embryos, were supposed to have a baby, and we failed. That's, this is like what's haunting us. And we must aim for the 100%. That paper that they published in the US, after three attempts, still 5% of the couples didn't get a baby. Doesn't make sense. We have to aim for the 100%. It's not a utopia. We have to do it. We have to make it. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Engine. Uh, yes. Um, I may thank the both uh, uh, speakers for the excellent, and I think this is one of the best debates I had in this topic. Both of you have shown great uh, deal of wisdom in approaching the question. And uh, we agree almost with all what you said, both of you. 
But I have one question for both of you. I have a lot of questions, but I have one question that is bothering me all the time. Can you tell me what's the clinical or research background for determining the four centimeter or five centimeter size of an endometrioma? I couldn't find any reference for that. So do you have anything about this? Who decided what's this threshold is important? Where they come from? four centimeters or five centimeters. Okay, can I, can I, uh, I have an answer over your question? Yes. Rama? Yes. Yeah? Are you hearing me? Yeah, okay. Uh, you're absolutely right. There is no the special publication which uh, uh, compare four or five centimeters. But in my opinion, if the size of uh, endometrioma is high, example, five centimeter, this patient typically has a lot of symptoms, such as pain, uh, such as dyspareunia. That is why it is uh, um, indication for surgery. Uh, in clinically, it's more important uh, big size of endometrioma. But uh, uh, we forget uh, the patient in this history uh, to offer patient IVF or surgery. And I think it's very important to ask my patient, what is the best way to be pregnant? And do believe me that if you ask a young patient, 20 years old with a small endometrioma, which way uh, is better for her to be pregnant, do believe me that all young patients uh, ask me to do surgery at the first step of treatment. That is why we can, uh, we can uh, uh, show patient and discuss with patient all ways to treat uh, infertility. And after that, find the best way uh, according to your opinion and the uh, patient's opinion and, of course, clinical research. Thank you. Uh, the, my answer is that looking at the studies that form the guidelines, for example, the have the done studies, they, they go, they refer, when they go to the, to the size, they refer to a, some older studies that uh, I didn't even bother reading. We need a marker. We need a marker like the Integrin and the BCL6. It doesn't matter how big the endometrioma is. If it's causing symptoms or if it's causing the endometrium not to be, uh, not to be receptive, then we need to do something. We need to remove. The size of the endometrioma is irrelevant. And that's why I didn't even put it in the, the last algorithm the, the ORCID algorithm. And I don't think that uh, that is relevant for, uh, for fertility. And that's why the studies are not ending up giving us help because they're focusing on the size, which is not important. Symptoms are important. Inflammation is important. Implantation potential is important. Prof. Engin, you have any questions or? Yes, I just have comments for this very good uh, lecture about uh, this hot issue. I believe we have two different patients. The first one, she has just one side and double side endometrioma, and there is no other indication for the IVF. And she has good ovarian reserve. She could benefit for the surgery, definitely. No discussion. She has no other indication for IVF. She has good ovarian reserve. And uh, only Bilateral. one... Bilateral bilateral we must be careful unilateral yes. okay two sides we must be careful the studies say yes you are right but if she has the good ovarian reserve that means bilateral endometrium up but amh level is six or five i mean the people's ovarian disease we can do it i believe but if she has the indication for the uh, ivf there is no place for uh, surgery before the IVF. That's the problem. Do it the surgery and send to the IVF uh, doctor. It is the wrong uh, malpractice, I believe, in my in my practice. The other thing, how can we find the four centimeter? It's coming from the extra guideline, unfortunately. In this guideline, uh, there will be no uh, size, something like that, four centimeter and five centimeter. You are right. And the last concern about the, the effect of endometriosis on implantation. You said you believe the, there is a problem with the implantation, but if we look at the 
donor cycle data, there is no effect for the implantation for the methods patient. That's why we don't know the it's coming from the oocyte or the endometrium. But we know that you suggest the PGS, but we know that we have the data data about this one. There is no increased risk of the unopened rate in endometrial patient. They have the same result with other indications. Thank you. Uh, on two things, I agree with everything you said. On two things, the data that you said about the donors, one of the studies, actually the most interesting study was by Professor Prapas in Salonika. And this is where I come from, yeah. The, the, the twin study to put it that way. And of course, donor eggs are super strong. They would implant anywhere. <laughs> We're talking about eggs from women over 35. That's the tough one. That's the ones that have been affected and they don't have the implantation potential. That's one. Number two, uh, on the uh, latest uh, that you said about the genetic testing, um, we're not doing, we're not offering to say, not doing the genetic testing of the embryos because of the actual endometriosis. We're offering because of time. These women don't have time. If I tell them you have five blastocysts frozen in their mind, they have five chances for a baby. After genetic testing, if all of them come back up normal, if I don't know, I will waste another year trying to transfer one by one, one by one, two by two. She might get a miscarriage, another six months gone. By then she's 37, 38. All this time I could have saved if I told her, look, five embryos, all abnormal. Let's go again. So that's why we do it. Not because endometriosis creates abnormal eggs and abnormal embryos. Uh, excuse me, can I ask uh, Professor Ragov and Dmitry a very nice, excellent debate. I would like to ask, did you try medical treatment before surgical intervention, especially in OMA with three or four CM? This is number one. Number two, uh, I would like to ask, uh, during closure of the ovary after ovarian cystectomy, uh, what about the incidence of hematomas? Uh, number, the third question, uh, the third question I would like to ask, what is the best time uh, for induction of ovulation uh, after uh, surgical intervention? This is more for Dr. Popov. That's okay, good. I, I, I'm ready to, yeah, I'm ready to, to have an answer. Um, uh, we don't use uh, treatment uh, before um, surgery, uh, but when we decide to wait before surgery, example, in the case when patient uh, wouldn't like to be pregnancy during uh, six or 12 months or maybe more, in this case, we prescribe uh, contraceptive pills or Diana guest in case of pain and endometriomas uh, would like to uh, uh, would like to do surgery later uh, uh, when she decide to be a pregnant. Okay, uh, we don't use uh, agonist because it's uh, uh, you know it's a very heavy uh, um, uh, symptoms of uh, like a flash and more and more. That is why we prefer to use Diana guest or contraceptive pills. Uh, we don't uh, have uh, gematomas after suture close of ovary because if you saw my technique, we uh, we, we prefer to use uh, um, uh, um, extra uh, corporal uh, uh, sutures with the uh, close of uh, a deep space uh, inside the ovary. That is why no place for gematomas. And the last question was, uh, uh, when uh, you will start to stimulate of uh, 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 cycle after surgery? You can wait six or eight uh, weeks, not months, weeks uh, before stimulation. Uh, you know, one of the best paper from Dr. Dizegler, you show a lot of paper from this very nice, very clear. And uh, uh, which showed us that it, uh, uh, 
not need uh, a long period to wait before stimulation. Six or eight uh, uh, weeks, it's enough uh, to prepare ovary for stimulation. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. I have one may, may I ask the question, Mamar? Okay, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks again for such an excellent uh, uh, debates and I have a question. I just wondering um, what is the best strategy for fertility preservation in young women with uh, large bilateral but asymptomatic endometriomas uh, if these uh, women uh, don't plan pregnancy right now, maybe uh, five years uh, later as they say. Could you please comment this clinical case if we have such patient? What about maybe ovarian tissue uh, conservation and um, what's better? The answer is easy. The answer is easy and it comes from, uh, from many studies. Mm -hmm. If the ovaries can stimulate well and they are accessible, mm -hmm. it's a young woman you say, yeah? Yeah. Please as many cycles of eggs as you can. Okay, there are algorithms now to tell us what are the chances of pregnancy for each age group, as if we have frozen five, 10, 20 eggs, let's say to a 30 year old, to a 32, to a 28. So we as doctors can counsel the women and say, you're 28, you have endometriosis, if I freeze 10 eggs for you now with the current technology, your mm -hmm. chance of a pregnancy of one baby when you decide to use them will be, let's say, 45%. If you freeze 20 eggs, might be 60%. And there are these, these catalogs, actually, these, uh, these uh, actually numbers exist. But uh, her endometriosis is not going to get any better with the years. Her AMH and the egg quality is not going to get better with the years. So ovarian tissue cryopreservation is still not giving us the baby rates that we want because we're talking babies, yeah? It's not giving us the baby rates that we want. So in such cases, we always say one, two cycles would be enough for this woman with good ovarian reserve to have like over 10, 10, 15 eggs in the bank and then she can decide on her future. When she meets her future husband, then if they, if they don't get pregnant naturally, then we can talk. Okay, but Why? unfortunately, in practical, from practical point of view, uh, many IVF centers um, don't like to stimulate such women with large endometrial woman, maybe eight uh, centimeters in diameter, five, six. It's it's not easy to to. Uh, have some agreement with IVF centers. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I said about, uh, sorry, to, to finish. That's what I said about the accessibility. Mm -hmm. If the endometrioma yeah. is surrounded, as it usually is in the ultrasound by healthy follicles, mm -hmm. it looks dramatic when you first scan here. But as I showed in the pictures, and that's why I put them there, in the end, you will not be able to see that. It will be like minimal, down, press down, and the nice, healthy follicles will allow collection. Sorry, Dr. Popo. Thank you. It's okay. I have it's very small comments. Uh, uh, we have yeah. 30 seconds. If you have a, a quick answer, uh, answer. Yeah, it's only a quick answer. Maybe one of the best choice for this patient is X collection. And of course, you can prepare this ovary for stimulation to do transvaginal function and aspiration of the cyst uh, before stimulation and all site collection. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank for this option. <laughs>